Go ahead. Ah, there you go. Good. I know this about when a church or a person or a family, whatever, whatever it is, whatever group it is, I just know this, when, when a person or a group or a church is getting on the right track, just be sure of this, the enemy is coming. Amen? We talked a little bit about that last week. I want to talk about it more this week. And I've titled the sermon today, Opposition. And the reason I, I was looking for a picture to go with that, and I found these flames, but I know this, that Peter says that uh, he talks about the fiery trial of our faith, that let it work patience in your life. Amen? And uh, so I just know that when we're on the right track, the enemy is going to come against you, and the enemy being Satan and his, his uh, minions, you know, his angels. They are coming against us uh, when we're doing the right thing, and, and we need to be aware of that. We need, to be, we need to have some understanding of that, or else we're going to get surprised, and we're not going to know what's going on. Uh, so we're going to talk about that just a little bit. Uh, today. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing on the service today. Dear God in heaven, Lord, I come before you today. I want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for just grace, and I thank you for your power and your might. Lord, I thank you for your resurrection, and that Jesus, that you have won the victory, Lord, over sin and over Satan and over hell. Lord, you've won the victory over this world, and and I pray that, Lord Jesus, as a church, that we can begin to live in that victory. And that, Lord Jesus, that we would be able to see you do amazing things, Lord, through these people and through this church and in this community. Lord, I know that it's not of ourselves that this will happen, but it's by the strength and the grace of God that these things can be. Lord, I know that you said that you will do above what we ask or think. And Father, I just thank you, Jesus, for your grace. And, and I pray that, Lord, that you'd help me today to be able to speak truth, Lord, as you have given me that truth. Lord, I pray for wisdom and I pray for your blessing on, on Lord, just over my mind and over my speech. Because, Lord, I know that I cannot do this without you. Father, I ask you just to bless these people as they listen. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would take this message, sow it into their hearts. And Lord, I, I pray that they would be able to connect with, with you, God, through it. And Lord, I pray that they'd be able to leave here this week and, and Lord, to live out their faith. And Lord Jesus, that you'd use these people to do your work in this world. And we'll give you the praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I want to go back to the diagram that I gave you last week and kind of go back over that a little bit. I, I, I'm, I, I want to just keep going over and over and over these things. I know time won't allow it, but remember we've talked about our vision. We've talked about our core values. And again, I'm not going to read back through those things today, but those things lead to our purpose and our purpose is to know, love and serve God first and foremost. Amen so that we can learn how to love, know, love, and serve our families, and know, love, and serve other people. And of course, our purpose leads, it goes into the congregation, it goes out into the community. But the next step I want to talk about today, and it will tie into the message of opposition here in just a moment, is about our focus. So we've kind of figured out what our values are, our vision is, our purpose is. Hopefully that's getting into the congregation. Hopefully we're beginning to use that. And I see that in a few things that, that some of y'all took the initiative to do here lately and taking that out into the community. But we need to begin to focus. Focus on what? Focus on our purpose. Not just talk about it. But let's stop and really think about it. Let's focus on that. And then come, you know, figure out a model or a plan in order to put that purpose into action. And Lord willing, next week we'll talk about the hardest of all things. I, I don't know that I'll get to it for sure next week, but for sure the week after, uh, if the Lord wills it, that we will talk about how to put it into action. It's really easy to speak words, right? 
It's really easy to say, this is what I want to do. It's really easy to say, this is what I need to do. How many of y'all do that? I need to read the Bible more. I need to pray more. I need to go talk to people about Jesus more. I need to do this or I need to do that. Some of y'all say, I need to exercise more. Whatever it is. It's easy to say what we need to do. What's the hard part? Doing it. We all know that's true, right? That's why everybody makes New Year's resolutions. You know, we just got into the new year and, and people make New Year's resolutions. They say, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And that all sounds good. And it sounds really good on New Year's Eve or right at the strike of midnight or, or maybe the next day. It's really another thing to do it tomorrow. It's really another thing to do it next month. It's really, a thing, it's, it's really another thing to do it throughout the year. Words are easy, actions, that's where the difficulty comes. So uh, what I want to talk about today a little bit, focusing on that purpose, thinking about a model, how do we put this into action? What is the best plan of action to put it into action? Let me just say it like this. How many of y'all have ever built a house? How many of y'all, you say, well, how many of y'all have ever had a house built? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of y'all have ever built a house yourself? How many, Ken is in the process of building a house right now. And here's what Ken would love for everybody to do. He would love for everybody to come help him build the house. I don't know if this is true or not, Ken. I'm sure he would take the help if you want to give it. Uh, but here's what Ken's going to do. If you'll go help Ken on his house, he's going to let you come. And he's saying, all right, just do it. That's not going to work very well, right? Especially now, he's got a frame, and he's, got a, he's putting the outside on it right now, and, and uh, he's, he's made some progress, but if he just had a foundation, and he just had a pile of lumber, and everybody showed up at Ken's house, and Ken says, hey, everybody just grab a board and start putting it together. How well is that going to work? What are y'all going to come up with? Who knows, right? Listen, we can have a focus and we can have a purpose, but if we don't have a plan how to put that into practice, we're going to have a mess. Amen? No telling what we're going to come up with. So I want to kind of continue to talk about that. This is where the thing starts getting way more difficult, though. So Bridget and I, when we were, you know, you know we, as many of you know, we've been taking some classes, and, and, and it's really been a benefit to us. And and even at 51 years old, I'm still learning. They say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. It gets harder, but it can be done, right? Uh, but uh, I, I wish that I wasn't as old as I am trying to learn new things. But, but anyway. But as we looked at this very diagram, I, I put question marks by focus and model. Because I, I didn't, I, what, I don't understand what this, I, I didn't get it. But I'm beginning to get it better. But the thing of it is, is, I know that we're getting into the more difficult part of it. Because you see, as I was born again at, at the age of 15 years old, and I started preaching when I was 16 years old, church was, the church that I knew is a little bit different. Uh, than, than maybe what I'm talking about here today. And what I mean by that is, 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 is when you got saved, you just kind of knew you went to church and church is where you learned and church was, I mean, it, the church was the end all. Does that make sense? It wasn't the means of which you went out. You went to church and that was just the end all. That was it. You you, so you got saved, and, and, and pretty much everybody in the church just says, well, you know, you'll figure it out if you just go to church. Church needs to play a major role in that, but I want it to be more than that. And so uh, I was just kind of brought up with this idea that, you know, you get saved, you go to church, and, and that's just what you do. And so uh, what I would love to do is for us to build a model or a plan that puts the church into action to where we're helping one another 
to grow and to know God deeper, to love God more and to serve God better, but also to take that out into the world and show people who Jesus is. Amen? And, and not only to show them who Christ is and bring them to salvation, but then take those people and be able to mentor those people and build those people up and help them to grow in their faith so that they can begin to share that with others. Amen? So I guess I want us to be enablers. Enablers is a, a term that usually people use associated with not good things, but I want us to be enablers in helping people to know how to serve God. Amen. To know how to, to not only to come to church, but to be able to take the church out into the world and live their faith in a real uh, way, in a way that, uh, you know, that is, it, it's a, a real walk. It's not just something we say. It is something we do. It is something that we live. So anyway, all that being said, let's look at the scriptures here. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17 through 18 says, Then said I unto them, and I read these verses I know last week, but I want to go back over them again today. Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in, how that Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. He got the people behind him. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. I want us to, to look at these verses just for a moment. What was their focus? Their focus was their purpose. They were focusing on their purpose as we talked about last week. Their focus was to rebuild the walls to turn the distress into a blessing and the reproach or the disgrace. They were wanted to return it back to the glory of God. And it says here that they strengthened their hands. Now you might say, well, that means they encouraged themselves. And that was part of it, no doubt about it. I'd like to get you all enthused about serving God. Amen? I mean, Garrett got up here and Garrett, now you know how I feel about you get up and you say something. You're like, amen, uh, amen. <laughs> right? I don't take no offense to it. I've been preaching a long time. I know how it is. But uh, I would love to encourage you. I, wanna, I want to enthuse you to be able to serve God, but I want it to be more than enthusiasm. You see, I want it to be more than emotion. I want it to be more than just a, a, a jump up and, and hurrah thing here. I want it to be something that you're able to go out those doors and begin to live and to walk and to, to be in this world. You see, he strength, they strengthened their hands. It was more than just encouragement. It was more, just, uh, more than just motivation, I think. I think what they began to do is they began to have a plan. You see, I can't believe that Nehemiah, he was an intelligent man, and he had, a, he had a great idea of what to do here, and I believe that he had a plan. He began to share that plan with these people, and I believe that they began to come up with a plan, a strategy, a model, if you will, on how to get this monumental task accomplished. Listen, remember what the Bible says, that they were able to rebuild these walls that were destroyed, these gates that were burnt with fire. Listen, these walls, you got, you got to understand something. They don't have bulldozers. Amen? They got to move a bunch of rubble out of the way before they can even begin to build. They do not have bulldozers. They do not have backhoes. They do not have excavators. Listen, they don't have machines. They have their hands. They got shovels. They got picks. They got whatever handmade tools that, they, that, that were there. They've got willpower, and they got sweat. They got effort, and they put it into this thing, and they accomplished this task in 52 days. 52 days, a monumental task, and in a miraculous amount of time, they were able to accomplish this. How? Why? Number one, because they had the power and the blessing of God on them. Amen? Amen. Listen, if we've got that, we got a lot. Amen. But I do believe that they strengthened their hands. They made a plan. They put a process together. They said, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. Now let's go get it done. So I believe that when it says they strengthened their hands, they made a blueprint. 
You see, if we went to work on Ken's house without a blueprint, we'd have a mess. We might have the will, and we might have the want, and we might have the tools. We might even have the knowledge But if we don't have a plan and we're all working against one another and and we're all doing our own thing and we're all not working toward that focus, we're going to have a mess. Listen, I want you to understand something about this, though, because this is the phase of the the message I want to preach today. And this, this this, this is a... You can apply this to your life as an individual. You can apply this to your marriage. You can apply this to the raising of your children. You can apply this to, your ch- to the church. You can apply this if you're a group leader or a Sunday school teacher or whatever it is. This is applicable to those things. And that is this. When we begin to do the right thing and we get on the right track and we have the right vision and we begin to have the right purpose, The enemy will stir, and he will attack. Let's look at the scripture here. The Bible tells us here in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 19, but when Sanballat, and I've not given you any information on these people, so just bear with me. They were the enemies of of the Jews. They were the enemies of this project. Satan was no doubt using these men to hinder this good work. It says, But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? And conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because them. Understand something. Satan will come against you when you want to do the right thing. Amen? You say, I'm going to be a better husband. By the grace of God, I'm going to be the husband that God's called me to be. Satan's coming. Amen? I'm just telling you. How does he come? How does he attack? What's the example of that? Well, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to wake up in the morning, perhaps, and say, you know what? I'm going, to be a, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be the husband God's called me to be. And maybe you wake up in the morning and you just have a really bad day. Satan makes sure of it. And you want to come home and, and maybe get, get it fussed with your wife. How many of you guys ever do that? How many of you all ever take it out on your wife? Raise your hand. Mine's way up high. I do that sometimes. I'm having a bad day. So she needs to have a bad day, right? Amen. Amen. (laughs) And if you didn't hear my wife, she said, what kind of sense does that make to anyone else? Makes sense to me. No. (laughs) I'm just saying, you think you're going to change? And it's going to be easy and the enemy isn't going to come? He's going to come. But understand something. I have overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Understand something. The Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead with victory over my sin. The Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead with victory over the enemy. Amen? So I can do all things through who? Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to be a better man. I'm going to be a better husband. Yes, the enemy's going to come, but I can tell the enemy to take a hike just like old Nehemiah did. Amen? Amen? Because I've got the power in me to do it because Jesus lives in me through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now then, but I just want to give you an example of that. Let me, let me give you another example. Listen, the enemy, you say, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a better husband. You don't think the enemy might put some kind of a something on your computer to distract your mind from your wife? You all know what I'm talking about? Listen, I'm just saying the pornography. He, he could take and say, you know what, I'm going to ruin your marriage through this. He might, he might even send some, somebody your way to get between you and your wife. You need to be careful. We need to be on guard. We need to, be care- we, we need to live in the power of Jesus lest the enemy get an advantage over us. And I'm just using those things for just an example. But they are possible. Now then, 
We need to understand that these attacks, you know, we're talking about a church vision, a church purpose, a church focus. But we need to understand these, these attacks won't just come on the church as a whole, but they will also become on the members of the church and their families individually. Listen, you know what? This church is made up of what? Individuals, right? We as individuals make up the body of Christ. We make up the church. So if Satan's going to attack, he's not just going to attack the organization. He's going to attack the individuals who make up that organization, right? Amen? Y'all understand what I'm saying? By us getting on the right track, I'm really probably inviting the enemy to come pick on your family. I'm probably inviting the enemy to come pick on your life because he wants to keep you off track lest the whole church get on the right track. Listen, I know for an absolute fact since, since I began to talk about these things, the enemy, I can feel his, his working in my life. I can feel his distractions. I see them. I understand them. I have fallen prey to them at times. But I know this, the enemy definitely is on the move. You say, man, this message isn't very fun. It's not very encouraging. I just want you to be real about it. I want you to understand, we don't have to live defeated, though. That's the, that's the joy of it. Amen? That's the excitement of it. I don't have to live defeated. I can live in victory, the victory that is in Christ alone. Now then, let's look on. He will especially attack those, especially attack those who connect with the vision and purpose and who want to get behind it and get involved. And this is this scripture here. Because it, this scripture tells us that these, this Sanballat, this Tobias, these Arabians, they conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. That's what he wants to do. Stop. Stop the work. Just go to church, mind your business, don't get involved in the world, don't get involved with other people, just go to church, go home, eat your dinner, forget about it. Isn't that what he wants to do? And what he wants to do is to, to cause turmoil and division and, and, and all that kind of thing where we can't get anything accomplished. He, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, so I better move on. So nevertheless, we may... We made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. What did they do? How did they respond to the attack? How'd they do it? What'd they do? They prayed, right? And then they armed themselves and then they set a watch. They become Vigilant and sober, as the New Testament says, because their adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, sought about whom that he may devour. The enemy was looking for a weakness, and they set a watch against him. They went to God and prayed, and they got the power of God involved in their life. And they were successful. Amen? It's a recipe for success. No doubt about it. Why does Satan care? I want you to understand some. Why does Satan care that a seemingly insignificant church, why does he care what they do? Because you see, the world would look at our church here in rural Missouri and they'd say, oh, you ain't going to do much. You're out in the middle of nowhere. I can't believe, listen to me this morning, I, I, and I'm just speaking from my heart. I cannot understand how so many people are coming to a rural church like this. Y'all, how many of y'all notice that? Because I'm somebody? No, I'm nobody. Because I'm some awesome preacher? No, I'm long-winded and boring, I'm sure. <laughs> long-winded for sure. Y'all don't come for me. You come because the power of God's so the world might look at this church and say, oh, it's insignificant. It doesn't, you know, it's not going to do much. Keep that in mind. Why does he care? 
Well, for the same reason he cared what these seemingly insignificant Jews did in Nehemiah's day. They were nobody. They had been captives for 70 years. Their walls were burnt. Their city was destroyed. Their their nation was practically dissolved. They were insignificant people. So why did Satan care if they rebuilt these walls? I want you to understand something about Satan. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, in whom the God, little g, little g, The God, Satan, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe, not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Listen, this verse tells us the answer to this question. Number one, the God of this world, Satan, not of this world is the creation. This is God's creation. But the world system belongs to Satan. This is his world. And it says that he has blinded the minds of them which believe not. This is his world. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. Here's the answer. We're a threat. How many of y'all know you're a threat to God's kingdom? Or to Satan's kingdom, rather. You're a threat to Satan's kingdom. This is what he says. The God of this world has blinded their eyes lest the glorious light of the gospel would come to them. Who holds the glorious light of the gospel? We do. Amen? Amen. We're a church of born-again believers. If you're saved here this morning, if you're born again, you have the answer of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ in your lungs, in your words, in your breath. And you have the ability to share that with lost people. And when we do that and we begin to see people saved and lives changed... We become a threat to Satan's kingdom. He hates it. And he is not going to stand idly by and let it happen. I'm I'm going to give you some really good news at the end of this sermon about that, though. You see, when this insignificant people began to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, they were fulfilling Scripture and allowing for the people to come back into the land. From which, the, from which, listen, this is important, from which the Savior would come. Why, why, was, why did Satan care about this insignificant people? Because they were rebuilding a city. They were rebuilding a nation of which the Savior, the Lord Jesus, would come through to bring salvation to all the world. And Satan wanted to stop that at all costs. The Bible tells us in the book of Daniel 9, 25 and in the first part of 26, Know therefore and understand, they were fulfilling Scripture, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself. Now this is a complex passage of Scripture, and I'm not going to dissect it today. But I want you to understand, this is a prophecy that Daniel had about the coming Messiah, about the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, about the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem, and that he says through that the Messiah would would come, and the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. What's he saying? He would be killed, but not for himself, but for me and for you. Amen? Satan wanted to stop that at all costs. Because in the Lord Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, Satan's kingdom was destroyed. Amen? Amen. Satan's kingdom has no power over the Lord Jesus Christ, because he has defeated it. 
I want you to remember what the Bible says in the book of Genesis when Satan deceived the woman and she gave to her husband and they did eat. He deceived Adam and Eve and they fell into rebellion and disobedience to God. You remember what what God said to the woman, said to Eve? He says, through your seed, you will crush his head. Amen? You'll bruise his heel. You'll hurt him a little. But he's going to crush your head, Lucifer. He's going to crush your head, Satan. You know what God's saying? One day the Messiah is going to come and he's going to defeat you. I'm glad to be on the winning side. Amen? Amen. All right. Anyway, let's look on. You see, again, we may seem to be insignificant, but Satan knows that we are dangerous. You're dangerous. You're dangerous to him. Amen? Amen? You're dangerous to his kingdom. He hates you and he wants to stop you at all costs because you are a danger to him. I want you to notice that Satan did not wait until they had begun to work to begin his attack. Again, Nehemiah 2, 18 and 19. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which is good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So strengthen their hands for this good work. They were just talking about it. Hey, this is what we need to do. This This is the direction we need to go. This is the plan we need to make. They were speaking the words. They were talking about it. They were getting ready to put it in action. But notice that the enemy did not wait. But when Sambalad and the Horonite and Tobiah, the servant of the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, when they heard about it, Then they began to attack. They laughed us to scorn, made us, tried to make them feel like idiots. They despised us and said, what is this thing that you will do? Will you rebel against the king? they They tried to make them afraid. They tried to discourage them. They didn't wait until the wall was being built. They started that before, just when it was in the talking stage. I say all that to say this. You need to be aware of this. Just talking about it makes hell stir up. Amen? He attacked when they came in the focus of their purpose and began to create a plan to fulfill that purpose. I want to give you an example of this real quickly before I close. Julie, if you'd come on up to the piano, please. One time, I don't know who found it, We were just talking about this the other day. I think maybe Grant found that giant wasp nest that was in our house, like in the the, behind the siding. You found it. I thought my recollection was that Grant found it, and he came. Man, look at all these wasps. So where my outside unit sits for my my heat pump, and all the lines go into the house through the vinyl siding there. There is a two-inch hole that nobody had that we had failed to seal. And there was red wasps that had built a nest inside of my wall, up in where the insulation and everything was. And I mean, listen, it was some kind of nest. How many of y'all notice about red wasps? I don't like red wasps. By the way, they have got to be part of the curse. (laughs) How many of y'all notice when you walk by a red wasp, he is always... It's just like he wants to sting you, right? Like, just give me a reason, buddy. (laughs) And uh, so this wasp, these wasps are in and out, in and out, in and out. I mean, they're just constant, in and out, in and out. Now, as long as I stayed away from them, they didn't mind too bad, right? They didn't sting me. They didn't... They didn't... uh, you know, they look at me and, like I said, turn and you know, kind of let me know, don't come near. That's kind of what Satan does, right? Satan does that very thing. I mean, he says, listen, church, it's, I don't like you, but as long as you don't bother my kingdom, we'll get along. But when they, when, so when Grant and I, when Grant found that nest, I thought, I've got to do something with that, that thing. So I got me a can of, Raid, you know, that stuff that shoots like 20 feet, right? 
and I, I get up there and listen, them, them wasps, you get too close, and they, they began to really become excited. Now, before I sprayed them, they were already letting me know, you are in danger, mister. Stay out of my, stay out of my kingdom. I wanted to tell them, you're in my kingdom. You're in my house. But they didn't care about that, right? But I had a focus, and my focus was, I'm going to kill them walls. I'm going to spray that nest. I'm going to get them. And we did. And I have never in my life seen so many walls pour out of a hole in my life. I mean, it was insane. Hundred plus walls pour out of that thing. But my point is this. Those wasps, as long as I didn't bother them, they were okay with me. But as soon as I got too close to their kingdom, they stirred up. And I'm telling you, when I began to retaliate against them, they began to mean business. Now, I got out of this deal without getting stung. I don't really know how, because I'm telling you, it was serious business. There's wasps going everywhere. But I want you to understand something. You invade Satan's kingdom, he's, he's going to come against you. But good news. The good news is this. The Bible tells me in the book of James, submit yourselves unto the mighty hand of God. Amen? So what we need to do as a church, submit ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Submit your life as an individual under the mighty hand of God. Submit your marriage under the mighty hand of God. Submit your children under the mighty hand of God. Resist the devil. What will he do? He will flee from you. He has no power over you if you're a believer. Resist him. Resist him. I want us to begin to focus on our purpose and develop a plan to fulfill that purpose. Then arm ourselves with the armor of God and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Being ready always for Satan's attacks and trusting in God's power to strengthen us and give us the victory. Amen? If you would, let's stand please this morning.